just really grateful for them this morning. And so John 20, 11 through 18 is where we're going to be this morning. John 20, 11 through 18. Let me read this passage. And what I'm going to do is instead of just going past the section by section and giving you points, I'm going to kind of summarize the story for you guys and then just highlight a few things um, at the end. John 20, 11 through verse 18. But Mary stood outside the tomb, crying. And as she was crying, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Because they've taken away my Lord, she told them, and I don't know where they put him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Woman, Jesus said to her, why are you crying? Who is it that you are seeking? Supposing that he was the gardener, she replied, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you put him and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. Turning around, she said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus told her, since I have not ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them that I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God, and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and she told him what he had said to her. The last few months, we've been seeing Jesus through the darkest hours of his earthly life. He spent the last hours before his death trying to convey to his students, his disciples, that he's going to die, and though it may seem like it's bad news, it was actually good news. I feel like Bolo preached half my message already this morning. And that was hard for the disciples to hear and for them to process. And even as he taught them, one of the most trusted of his band, the one that he trusted with the finances of the ministry, decides to betray him. And despite all of this, Jesus continues to teach them and pray for them, and invest into their lives, and he even takes time to wash their feet. And even as he prayed, sweating blood from the agony of knowing that the cross is before him, his disciples who he encouraged to pray with him slept in the middle of the night. And then Jesus faced the greatest acts of injustice in the history of the world. He was dragged through a kangaroo court, not guilty until proven innocent, but guilty, period, without even a proper trial. And he was then pitched in b back and forth to different judges who all conspired to have him done away with, except one, the most evil one, Pilate. Pilate didn't want to see him killed, and even his wife had a dream saying, don't kill him. And yet, because he cared more about his popularity and about his name in the community, he decided to kill Jesus and choose his own self over Jesus. Jesus is then not only betrayed and mocked, but he's beaten to a pulp. He's beaten so badly that he virtually dies from the beatings and he's left as an appearance that doesn't resemble humanity. And finally, he's led down the streets carrying a beam across his back, being insulted by the crowds, mocked by people around him, and then nailed to a cross and crucified. His body was thrown into a grave cut out of a rock and sealed. The Roman soldiers stood guard over it, not one but two, three days, and three days pass. And on the third day, early in the morning, the soldiers see an angel appear, and they run like a dog with its tail caught between its legs. And once the stone was rolled away, Jesus comes walking out with swagger in his steps, kind of like Iron Man in the movie, and we'll leave it at that. He had <laughs> rose again, triumphing over the grave. What seemed like loss, what seemed like pain, what seemed like defeat, was actually victory. Jesus really did die. He really was buried and he really rose again. And as a result, he really did change the lives of people permanently. We saw last week that he changed the lives of two prominent people in the culture of that time. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. And this week we're going to see how the resurrection did a number on one person on the opposite end of the cultural spectrum. A woman by the name of Mary Magdalene. Not only was Mary a woman, a woman who was devalued in culture, but she was also a former mental patient who was possessed by demons. The woman's life was turned upside down 
by Jesus. So let's look at the story together. I'll make some comments as we read the passages, and then I'll give you some summary points at the end this morning. Peter and John, who apparently left Mary in the dust when she told them that someone stole the body of Jesus, they've now left the tomb. And about that time, Mary now comes back and shows up. And she's there standing outside the tomb in despair, in sorrow, all alone. Now listen, the weeping of Mary wasn't a sniffle as if her allergies were acting up, but it was sorrow. It was wailing. It's used in scriptures of family members crying when a loved one died. It was used of Peter's response when the rooster crowed three times. So Mary is completely broken here. She's distraught. Her soul is heavy as she leans against the rock that was probably the only thing supporting her as her strength has probably withered. And what keeps her at the tomb when everything seems lost? It wasn't curiosity. It wasn't faith. It wasn't even hope in a miracle it was going to happen. But it was love love. Jesus had brought her hope when he cast demons out of her. Think about all that she had gone through. The person that she loved the most was now executed. She had planned to visit his body one last time and when she gets there it's gone. Apparently been stolen by some sick twisted thief. She'd been back and forth from the city to the tomb which remember was outside the city gates twice now. And she's exhausted. She probably hadn't slept much, much in the last two nights. And she, when she got back this time, Peter and John, who went before her, are now already gone. And she thought she was going to see them, but they're not there. She's alone, deserted. And beyond her emotional capacity to hold it together, and you can picture her outside the tomb just weeping. She's bawling. You can't console her. You can't comfort her. She is weeping. And then she finally gathers herself enough strength to peek into the tomb even as the tears continue to flow and heart pounding from sorrow as she starts grasping for hair, air. And you can imagine her slowly looking into the tomb with tears in her eyes. And when she peeks in, she sees two people inside. They weren't there the first time she went into the tomb. <coughs> and all of a sudden, fear hits her. Are these the grave robbers who return now to get the valuable spices and wrappings that they apparently left behind the first time? In Mary's mind, they must have been hiding in the dark corners of the tomb when Peter rushed in and when John rushed in, and they missed them. But as she looks at their posture... They're not fearing. They're not hiding. They're sitting on the rock ledge with their legs just rocking back and forth where Jesus' body had rested. Their garb is gleaming white. It's bright white, which means they must have been a pretty efficient type of theme that they, a thief that they didn't get any blood or dirt on their bodies. Virtually every use of this word white in the Bible is a gleaming white. It's the white of holiness and purity. It's the word that's used of Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration and in Revelation when he's coming back. Matthew and Luke say that their clothes gleamed like lightning and were white as snow. So you can imagine Mary trying to shield her eyes as she tries to look at them. And from all appearances, these guys look like normal guys, yet Scripture says that they were angels. Now listen, these weren't... The angels that we picture, short, round, um, with a harp and trying to fly with wings that are bigger than them. That's not the type of angels that we're picturing here. These are, they look just like humans. In the Old Testament, angels many times appeared as human visitors. And that's what we have in our text here this morning. And notice how Mary perceives them. She perceives them as humans. And all of a sudden, these two angels speak. And you would think that if they were thieves, they'd be yelling at her, or they were, they'd be pulling out their swords and their knives coming out at, at Mary. You'd think they'd be rattled and jump off of their stone and run for their lives and move to like the Mission Impossible jingle, right? Trying to get out of there as quickly as possible. Instead, they express concern and concern for Mary. Remember, this is 
what she's thinking the whole time. These are thieves. These are not anything supernatural. Supernatural doesn't cross her mind at this point. It's not there. She's not thinking resurrection. She's not thinking a miracle. She's thinking she's coming back to the tomb this morning to take care of the body of Jesus and Jesus is not there. Someone stole him. Stole him. Mary thinks for a moment that these two guys aren't the thieves that she thought they were. So she refers, and says, refers to them and says, Hey, someone stole the body of Jesus. They must be two guys in gleaming white outfits who just like to kick it in dead men's graves. And so Mary didn't make much of it and just started talking to those regular people. Mary is a mess. She isn't even thinking straight at this point. And then she tries to explain why she's crying so much. She explains that they, whoever they are, have taken the body of Jesus, her teacher, her master, her savior, and she doesn't know where they put the body. And again, resurrection is not even on her radar. And no sooner had she said those words when we find another man entering the tomb. The early church fathers, they say that at one point the angel simply motions for Mary to look back and see this other man, and Mary turns around and looks. You see, Mary had no clue that this was Jesus. Why? He hadn't spoken a word at all. And again, Mary wasn't expecting resurrection. The last, the last thing Mary was expecting. And to be fair to Mary, many people didn't recognize Jesus at first. The disciples on the road to Emmaus didn't know that was Jesus. The disciples in the boat in Luke, John 21 didn't recognize that it was Jesus. Maybe she couldn't see from the tears in her eyes. Maybe she was slightly blinded by the white of the angel's clothes. We don't know. One thing we know is that apparently Jesus looked like a normal man. He's resurrected. He's glorified. And yet still resembles a man, which is what he is. He is a God-man. Remember that the last image that was embedded in Mary's mind was this hunk of meat that was completely beat up, that was buried in a tomb. One that the prophet Isaiah says was so unrecognizable even as a human. And yet his body could be touched as we'll see with Thomas. It could eat food. It bore the marks of the crucifixion. But it would also rise through the, clothes of the, uh, through the grave clothes. It would appear in a locked room and it would eventually fly. This is so amazing because considering that you and I will have this same kind of body in the new earth. Philippians says this way, Jesus who will transform our lowly bodies to be like His glorious body. We're going to have the same bodies as Jesus. And now all of a sudden Jesus speaks. And He says, why are you weeping? Why didn't Mary pick up on His voice? Again, we don't know. Other than Mary's expectation is, there's no way this is Jesus. He's still dead. Someone stole the body, and now Mary thinks that Jesus is the gardener for the field where the tomb was located in. And she kindly asks, hey, are you the grave robber? Because if you are, just tell me where the body is, and I'll go get the body for you. You don't even have to worry about it. I will take care of the body. Think about this. Mary is out of her mind at this point. You're asking someone that you think stole the body, and you're saying, hey, just give it to me. Right? You could have been, if that, they were the grave robbers, Mary would be killed right now. This is dangerous because Mary would now identify the thief if that was him. And she could possibly kill her for seeing him. But Mary at this point doesn't care at all. Part of her already died when Jesus died. She loves Jesus more than anyone because he loved her when no one else did. And she asked for the body. He hadn't even, but hasn't thought about what she would really do with the body, right? What is Mary going to do? Hey, give me the body. I'm going to go carry that body of Jesus somewhere by myself. What am I going to do with this? Mary's not thinking straight at all. And at this moment, Jesus speaks to her and says, Mary. And she turns to him. And she says in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And all of a sudden, in one simple word, everything floods into Mary's mind. And think about what that word was. Her name. Her name. The fact that Jesus knows her by name. The fact that Jesus knows you and I by name. We're not just 
one of his many disciples. We're not just someone out there. He knows us by name. I shared this a few weeks ago, but when Jesus rises from the dead, he tells Mary, go and tell my disciples and Peter that I want to see them. Right? Why did Jesus call Peter out by name? Was he not because he was a disciple anymore because of all the sins that he did? Was it because he failed too much that he's no longer one of his inner circles? It wasn't. Because in those moments when we fail, in those moments when we feel alone, in those moments when we feel isolated, in those moments when we wonder if we're good enough, that's when God comes and he doesn't just lump us together and say you're just one of the group. That's when in those moments we hear God call us by name. It's in those moments we need to hear the name, the voice of Jesus calling you by name. That he loves you. That he's not done with you. That he has a plan and purpose for you. And here Mary hears that her name being called by her Savior and her countenance change, her demeanor changes, her attitude changes, her life now in this moment has changed. She will never forget the call of Jesus. She will never forget that Jesus knew her before she knew him. She will never forget that Jesus loved her before she loved him. And so here is Jesus simply calling the name of Jesus and all of a sudden everything floods into Mary's mind with the memory of how Jesus loved her, how Jesus transformed her, how Jesus rescued her. And she runs and she bear hugs Jesus. And the imagery here is not Jesus, just Mary just giving Jesus a hug. It is Mary just basically not letting go. It's a tight grip. This is like a wrestling move that Mary is doing on Jesus. And Jesus is like, hey, let me go. Right? It's a death grip. And he's trying to get her off of him. And Jesus says, hey, settle down. Calm down. Let me go. Apparently Mary wasn't going to let Jesus go unless he said this. He's like, hey, get a grip, but not on me, right? And the verb is like, stop clinging so tightly at this moment. Basically, hey, this hurts, let me go. And she probably fell on his feet and grasped him by the feet and she begins to worship him. And Jesus tells Mary that, hey, don't hang on to me because I'm not going anywhere. She no doubt thought that Jesus was going to disappear again. Listen, there's some that propose that followers of Jesus really never saw Jesus, but they were just hallucinating. They say that this is too much Taco Bell after midnight and there's just crazy dreams, right? But this is amazing considering that there were over 500 people recorded that saw Jesus at once, according to Paul. Unless they were all hallucinating. And not to be outdone, but there are others who propose that there was a mis mistaken identity theory. This is the idea that someone impersonated Jesus. But if this was true, then he had to go through the crucifixion, mimic the voice of Jesus and his mannerisms in such a way that someone like Mary would be gullible enough to believe. And this is also assuming that someone was interested in impersonating a broke homeless criminal whose entire band of followers abandoned him. Impersonating the king for a kingdom, yes. Impersonating a broke, homeless, convicted criminal by Rome while living in a Roman territory for nothing? No. Not happening. And so Mary falls at the feet of the real Jesus who had been raised from the dead and notice the message that she used to carry. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, verse 18, I have seen the Lord and that he has said these things to her. So what? Why does this matter? Look at the power of the resurrection in the life of Mary. The power of the resurrection, which is also available to you and I this morning, if we would just simply believe. I want you to notice just five things that happen to Mary here. Five things that happen to Mary. Number one, the resurrection transforms her. It transforms her. It transforms you. Mary was transformed. Here was Mary at the tomb in verse 11, depressed, crying uncontrollably, and no doubt, she had not slept for two nights. But when she finally had her eyes open to see Jesus, not dead, but alive, she was transformed. You see, Mary at that moment experienced in a way her own resurrection. She was in that moment born again. She had gone from sorrow to joy, from despair to hope, from darkness to light, from death to life. You see, a dead Jesus brought no true change to Mary, and a dead Jesus doesn't bring any change for you and I. 
But seeing him alive meant that he would now love her, not just to death, but into death and back alive again. She would now be loved forever. Her sin would be removed forever because Jesus was alive forever. Mary was crushed by her own sin, no doubt being tortured by her past. And she had a glimmer of hope when Jesus cast the demons out of her. But now she's wondering in her mind, are those demons going to come back? Who's going to love me? Who's going to care for me? Who's going to watch out for me to make sure that I'm protected? She no doubt would be tortured by those demons. And she finds herself out of her mind in this moment. The accounts that we have in scripture of people who are possessed by demons were people not only in despair, but they had a divided conscience. They experienced extreme emotions. They had long continued fits of silence. She was probably running up and down the street screaming and half naked when Jesus first encountered her. But now that Jesus was alive, he had the power to keep them away and he had the power to surround her and to keep her. She would never be the same again. The resurrection of Jesus, friends, is the only explanation of the change that occurred in Mary's life and it's the only explanation of the change that occurs in your life and my life. Colossians says it this way, He delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, in whom we have the forgiveness of our sins. Listen, if you know Jesus this morning, if you're a follower of Jesus here this morning, you need to remember the chains of sins that you were once held hostage to, to the futility of trying to fix yourself and find satisfaction of everything in this world. Psalm 107 says it this way. Some sat in darkness and in the shadows of death, prisoners in affliction and in irons, for they rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. So he bowed their hearts down with labor. They fell down with no one to help them. And then they cried to God in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and burst their bonds apart. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of Israel. For he shattered the doors of bronze and cut into the bars of iron. Friends, when you remember the irons and the chains that you were held bondage to, they might have been big things, they might have been small things, but when you remember what you were before Jesus and the subsequent freedom that was brought to you through Jesus, then you begin to experience transformation. You see Jesus through different lenses. You go from trying to change to being changed. You go from guilt to freedom. Charles Spurgeon put it this way, let me paraphrase. He said, when I regarded God as a judge up there, I thought my sin was just silly. But when I knew him to be my father, when I knew him to be one that loved me, then I mourned that I would ever kick against him. When I thought that God was hard, I found it so easy to sin. But when I found that God was so kind, so good, so overwhelming with compassion, I beat my chest to think that I would have ever rebelled against the one who loved me so and sought my good. Do you realize how much he loves you? Do you realize how much he cares for you? Do you realize how much he gave for you? If your life is not looking more and more like Jesus, you need to remember your chains. You need to remember that He rescued you and He's delivered you. You need to remember again that He is not on the other side of sin waiting to judge and condemn you, but He has gone into the trenches of your life and your sin to deliver you and redeem you from that. Listen, if you're struggling with sin this morning, if you're struggling with um, continually falling in sin, can I challenge you? Do you love Jesus? Are you genuinely in love with Jesus? Are you fixing your eyes on Jesus or are you so caught up in your sin and your momentary pleasure that you keep falling? And can I challenge you that if you are struggling, would you get your eyes off of your sin for a moment? Would you get your eyes off of the things that are capturing you and get your eyes on Jesus? Can you guys see the words that are written there? Can any of you see it? 
My, my hope is your answer is no, right? <laughs> None of you can see that, right? You can't see that, but can you see what color this is? What color is this? Yellow. <laughs> All right. Your sin is like that little piece of writing in there. The problem is we end up focusing so much on that little piece of writing that we pull it up closer and closer and closer. The only thing we see is our sin. And Jesus says, hey, your sin is small. My grace is humongous. My grace is the yellow that's around you. But you're so focused on your sin that you're, and you focus all of your energy and your effort of trying to overcome your sin that you forget the grace that I've given you. If you will get your eyes off of your sin and get your eyes onto Jesus, Jesus will transform you. If you focus on your sin, you will be overwhelmed and you'll feel like you will never succeed. But if you get your eyes on the goodness of Jesus, the kindness of Jesus, the mercies of Jesus, the, the blessings of Jesus, the grace of Jesus, if you allow yourself to be overwhelmed by all that Jesus has done for you, listen, your sin will become smaller and smaller and smaller. And eventually you'll get to that place where you realize that that sin has no bondage on me. And you realize what caused that? It wasn't that you figured out a way to overcome it. You just grew more and more in love with Jesus. Some of you are struggling because you're trying to manage sin and overcome sin and all of your focus is on your sin. And can I encourage you this morning that you need to get your eyes off of your sin and get your eyes onto Jesus. See Him in His glory. See Him in His majesty. See Him as one who is for you and not against you. See Him as one who has already won the victory over sin for you. And when you let that overwhelm you, you will win. Sin will eventually lose its grip. But when you keep your eyes on the things that hold you back, the sin will win. Because that's the only thing you're focused on. You need to see something bigger and greater. And friends, Jesus is bigger and greater. And He can give you victory where you need it. Number two, Look at how the resurrection of Jesus propels you. The resurrection propels you on mission. Listen, if you have experienced the resurrection in your own heart, you can't keep it to yourself. The resurrection of Jesus set the whole world on fire through his followers. When Mary is clinging to Jesus and he's telling her, go, he's saying, listen, this is a time for joy and sharing the good news, not for clutching on to me as if I am some something that you need to privately guard and protect. Clinging to Jesus and communing with Jesus is good and necessary and right. But friends, you and I are also called to communicate and hear Him say to us as well, go and tell. Go and tell. And notice that Jesus sends Mary on mission. Why didn't He just say, go and tell, the, why didn't He just go and tell the disciples Himself? He, he will do that and eventually. But He's getting them ready to be missionaries. They're practicing go and tell philosophy. John 20, verses 21. Jesus said to him, Peace be with you as the Father sent me, so now I send you. Friends, what propelled the early Test New Testament church, what propelled the apostles to live and die for their faith was the belief in the resurrection. It's brought up over a dozen times in the book of Acts. Ridicule, prison, torture, even death couldn't stop them because they knew that because he was raised from the dead, they would eventually be raised from the dead. It caused followers of Jesus to care more about other people than it did about themselves. It completely changed their worldview. And the whole movement of Christianity was propelled by a mercy and a compassion for others that the world has never seen. They fought for justice. They cared for the poor. They, tra they transformed lives by the word of the gospel. And it was started by the belief in the resurrection of Jesus. You see, Jesus rose from the grave bodily, not just spiritually. His bodily resurrection puts an emphasis not just on the spiritual, that we just care about the spiritual stuff, but on the physical on the entire person. The message of the resurrection is that our world matters. That the injustices and the pains of this present world must be addressed and who better to address it than the church. That, there, that we have news of healing, news of justice, news that love has won. If Easter means 
that Jesus is just raised in a spiritual sense, that if it's only about me and finding a new dimension in my personal life, if that's it, but if Jesus is truly risen from the dead, Christianity becomes good news not just for me personally, but Christianity becomes good news for everyone around me. Easter means that in a world where there is injustice, in a world where there is violence, in a world where children are exploited, in a world where degradation is epidemic, God is not prepared to tolerate such things that we will work and plan with all the energy of God to implement the victory of Jesus over all of it. Take away Easter, take away the resurrection, and Karl Marx was absolutely right to accuse Christianity of ignoring problems of this world. Take away resurrection, and Freud was right to say that Christianity is wish fulfillment. Take away the resurrection, and Nietzsche was right to say that we are just wimps. The resurrection not only transformed their lives, but it sent them on mission to rescue and restore, to proclaim and perform, to announce justification and to call for justice. Listen, people matter because Jesus rose from the dead. And friends, God has put you around people. Every person you are around matters. If the resurre resurrection sinks deep in you, those people must matter to God. You need to love them. You need to call, you need to point them toward Jesus. Number three, the resurrection places you. As a result of the resurrection, we are placed, friends, into the family of God. We saw this at the cross when Jesus was telling Mary that John, that they are now mother and son. And now we see as a result of the resurrection, the same thing. Look at the message that Jesus told her to convey. It's amazing. Verse 17. He says, Jesus wanted them to know that he's alive, that he's risen from the dead, and now that his father is their father, and that their God, his God is their God. Because of the resurrection, we are now sons and daughters of God. We are not naturally born into the family, but we were alienated from God at birth, and yet when God's grace comes alive in our hearts, we have been brought into the family of God. We have been adopted. Ephesians 2. You were dead in your trespasses and in the sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working, the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of humanity. But here's the key word, but God. But God. But God being rich in mercy. But God because of his great love which he has loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses. But God made us alive together with Christ. But God by grace you and I are saved. But God. Our identity is that we are sons and daughters of God. Not because of any good that we have done to earn it, but because of the death and resurrection of Jesus and our subsequent faith in Him. We can now, friends, call God our Father and we can talk to Him anytime. We can be still in His presence and just be knowing that He's there. We have the confidence of knowing that there is no one in this world, on earth or in heaven or in hell, that can snatch us out of the hands of God. We are safe. We are secure. We belong to Jesus. And friends, it gets even better when we die. Because when we die, we get to see him face to face for eternity. That means in this room we are now brothers and sisters as well. You know the word brothers is used four times in the Gospel of John. Until this point, it was always used to refer to the family of Jesus, but now it refers to the spiritual family. So whether you like the person you're sitting next to or dislike them, you belong to them. Your family. You have responsibilities toward them that must be carried out in love toward them. As long as you live in this earth, you are in debt to each other. Whether you have done 
whether they have done much for you or little for you. Because Christ has done everything for you. And He demands that your indebtedness to Him now be transferred to one another. Or family. Number four, He honors. He honors. I love how Jesus completely turns the culture on their head by choosing to reveal Himself, first of all, to a woman named Mary. I've shared this before, but a typical prayer of a Jewish man is this. Lord, I thank you I'm not a Gentile. I thank you I'm not a slave. I thank you I'm not a woman. And yet here we find a woman who used to be a slave to demons. And in other Gospels we find a Roman soldier who's a Gentile as one of the first believers of Jesus at the cross and at the gravesite. Jesus could have easily revealed himself to Peter, to John, to James, or any of the other disciples, but he chose not to. Instead, he chose to reveal himself first to a woman by the name of Mary, and in doing so, he elevated the position and the honor of women in that culture and in our culture. In that culture, they would throw women, female infants to die of exposure. A woman's testimony in court was not valid. Men could have extramarital affairs and mistresses, but if a woman committed adultery, she would be killed by stoning. But the church honored women. They held all life to be honorable, whether they be infants or elderly. They supported widows. They allowed them to retain their estate. They told the husband and the wife to keep your pants on and stay faithful to one another and honor one another and the marriage covenant. The church saw men and women as together, not inferior. They saw and upheld God's design for men and women. Galatians 3 says it this way, There is no more Greek, no more Jew. There is neither slave nor free. There is no more male nor female. We are one in Jesus. See, the Bible commands that men we take care of and honor not only our wives, but all women. And yet, as we look at the story, we see the opposite happening among the disciples. It seems like Peter and John left Mary in the dust. They didn't care for her. They didn't comfort her. They didn't minister to her. And then she shortly followed them. And by the time they got there, they left her again. They completely neglected her. She was left alone, uninformed, weeping. But here comes Jesus. He uplifts her. She's the first witness of the resurrection, the first missionary of the church, the first evangelist of the church. The fact that it is a woman is a testimony of the proof of the resurrection. Their testimony wasn't even allowed in the courts. The world would laugh saying a woman was the first witness. And yet Jesus chose a woman, not a man, to be his first witness. And not just any woman, but a former mental patient, not just a pillar of the community. He comforted her. He honored her. He elevated her. Last thing. The resurrection fills you. See, in this moment, Mary was filled with grace. Forgiveness, patience, humility were all shown by Mary. And Mary could have easily rubbed off, rubbed it in and boasted to the disciples to say, hey, I'm the first to saw Jesus. She could have done all of that. But Mary didn't care if she was first. Mary didn't care if she was right. She just cared that Jesus was alive. When she told the disciples, they didn't even believe her, according to the other gospel accounts. But we don't see anywhere Mary boasting or telling them off or starting her own religion. And think about how big of a temptation that would have been. She showed grace because she had already been shown grace by Jesus. Friends, Mary was melted by the gospel. Think about when Mary thought about when she heard that she was a child of God. Me? I used to do sins that were unforgivable. I used to run around the streets out of my mind. I was the laughing stock of the community. I was the one that no one wanted to be around. Are you sure, Jesus, you want me in your family? I've got to be the last pick on the softball team. But Jesus says, no, I'm going to choose you first. I'm going to use you first. See, because Mary knew her sin all too well. She knew what she actually deserved. 
And she saw Jesus get beaten until he was unrecognizable and suffer tremendous pain and be rejected by the Father. And yet at the same time, she saw that Jesus was willingly willing to go through all of this for her. Her heart melted. Her life was changed. She experienced joy and humility at the same time. Brokenness and boldness resulted. She didn't care if anyone else rejected her. The only thing that mattered in that moment was that she, she of all people, was a child of God and that Jesus was alive. Friends, it doesn't matter what other people say of you. It doesn't matter what other people think of you. It doesn't even matter if other people still label you by your past sins. Jesus doesn't. Jesus doesn't. He says, you're my brother, you're my sister. And God the Father looks down and says, you are my son and you are my daughter. Hear those words this morning. John Bunyan, as I close, was a Puritan who wrote the second most published book in history, Pilgrim's Progress. He spent a dozen years in prison for his faith and preaching the gospel. And there in prison, he wrote a book called Pilgrim's Progress, along with several other books. He was a man that was transformed by the grace of God that filled him up to overflowing love for his people in the prison. When religious opponents would argue with him in prison, when they would urge him not to assure his other Christian friends of God's unchanging love for them, And they kept saying, listen, if you keep assuring the people of God's love, they'll do whatever they want. They'll live in sin. They'll rebel against Jesus. But Bunyan responded from his prison cell. He said, if I assure God's people of his love, they won't do whatever they want. They'll do whatever he wants. They'll do whatever he wants. Listen, when you are overwhelmed with the love of Jesus... We don't need to tell you whether to do right or wrong. You will just want to do whatever he wants. So can I ask you, this morning if you're doing whatever you want, the question is not get your act together. The question is, are you overwhelmed by his love? Are you overwhelmed by his love in such a way that you will do whatever he wants? Are you overwhelmed by his love in such a way that you will do like we sang a few weeks ago at Easter? Whatever you say, Lord, I will say. Whatever you want me to do, Lord, I will do. Wherever you want me to go, Lord, I will go. Whatever it is that you desire for me, I will do because your love has overwhelmed me and captured me. And I want to bring glory, honor to you. Are you overwhelmed by the love of Jesus this morning? As we come to communion this morning, this bread, this juice reminds us of the love of Jesus for us. It reminds us that while you and I were sinners, while you and I deserved nothing but judgment and condemnation, while you and I deserved the eternal wrath of God, Christ gave his life. He died for us so that we could be part of the family of God. So would you this morning, would you take a moment, would you examine your hearts, your attitudes, your affections, your desires. Would you allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you, to speak to you? And listen, He will. He'll bring you to conviction on those areas where you need to surrender. Would you respond to Him? But more than anything, would you leave here this morning asking Jesus, would you overwhelm me with your love? Would you consume me with your presence? This morning, if you're here, you need prayer. We've got people in the back available ready to pray with you. I invite you, would you go pray with them? Would you let them minister to you? It could be something related to the message this morning. It could be something you're going through in life. It could be finals you're taking. You just want someone to pray with you. They're just available in the back, ready to pray. Would you spend some time in prayer with them? Maybe you're not a follower of Jesus this morning. Can I invite you? Maybe this morning the Holy Spirit is working in your heart and you want someone to pray with you. These guys in the back will be available to pray with you as well. Would you just go spend some time with them? The way we do communion here, the worship team's about to sing. As we sing, would you just spend some time meditating on the message, allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to you? Would you respond? Then as you respond, whenever you're ready, would you come, grab the elements from the table, the, the
the piece of bread, the juice, remembering the finished work of Jesus for your life. And let's celebrate what Jesus has done so that this morning we can be called sons and daughters of God. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this story of this woman named Mary that you've put in Scripture to remind us that you weren't looking for the best of the best. You're looking for sinners who are broken and messed up, just like all of us in this room are. You didn't choose the finest of this world. You chose us. Because through us, you will be the most glorified. But Father, we confess that there are too many things in this world that capture our attention more than Jesus, capture our affections more than Jesus. Would you forgive us would you draw us back to a first love of Jesus? Would you help us to live lives where we will do whatever you want? So God be glorified today. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.